Amen. Well, we're in the book of Romans. We will begin Romans 9 this morning. It's page 888 in your pew Bibles. And let me encourage you to be reading ahead. Here's our plan for the rest of the fall. We'll cover Romans 9 and Romans 10, and then we will enter into Advent where we'll be looking at the book of Malachi. But Romans 9, 10, and 11, they are some of the densest, weightiest chapters in all of Scripture. If you've never read them or wrestled with them, let me encourage you to be reading ahead so you can come in here prepared to engage the Word. This morning will be challenging, but it'll be a challenging in a different way than the coming weeks will be. We're going to look just at the first five verses of Romans 9. Hear the word of the Lord. Romans 9, verse 1. The Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, says this. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ." who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Amen. We're going to look at the details of this passage and then look at some takeaways for us and see that those who've been rescued by Jesus ought to be broken for those who don't know Jesus. Notice verse 1, the way he begins. He wants us to see that he's serious. And so he says, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. I'm telling the truth. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness, but it's not just me. It's in the Holy Spirit. He's got this threefold emphasis on the truth. I speak the truth. I'm not lying. This is real talk. Paul's serious, and he wants us to know that he's serious. Verse 2. What is he serious about? That I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Notice he doesn't just say that he has sorrow. He doesn't just say that he has anguish. Those words aren't strong enough. He adds these adjectives. Great sorrow, unceasing anguish in his heart. And we know the Apostle Paul. We know this wasn't some weak man, but he's broken for the lost. So much so that he would trade places with them. Were it possible, he says, I could wish myself accursed, condemned, cut off from Christ for the sake of his brothers, his kinsmen, according to the flesh. Now, Paul knows this is an impossibility. If you were with us, that's what we saw in Romans chapter 8, that he listed just about every threat to our security. And he concluded that nothing in all creation will be able to separate believers from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. But if he could, he would. Luther said that it's incredible that a man would desire to be damned in order that the damned might be saved. But here's what we have in the heart of the Apostle Paul. He desperately wants his fellow Israelites to be saved. They're rejecting the gospel. And Paul is torn up about it. He has great sorrow, unceasing anguish. He's burdened. He's broken. He knows the goodness of knowing Christ. And he knows the consequences of rejecting Christ. And he would give it all up if somehow it meant that his brothers and sisters were saved. And here Paul really is just following the footsteps of Moses. You remember the golden calf incident? God redeems his people and Moses is up and they get impatient and they throw in their jewelry and they build this golden calf and they worship it and they give it credit. Remember that heinous, heinous, heinous sin right after the Exodus? Well, notice what we read in Exodus 32. The next day, Moses said to the people, you've sinned a great sin, and now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, alas, this people has sinned a great sin. They've made for themselves gods of gold. But now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. Moses, too, says, let me take their place. Paul, broken for the lostness of Israel. Flip over, maybe it's right there open in the same page, chapter 10, verse 1. 
Paul says, my brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they might be saved. Paul is consumed with it. He's broken with it. He's torn up with it. By the way, just a footnote to be aware of some false teaching. There are false teachers, sometimes called Zionists, but others, there's other faithful Zionists. So you got to be careful with labels. But some teach that the Jews will be saved regardless of their faith in Christ. Well, they have the covenant, and they were God's chosen people in the old covenant. So regardless of what they do with Jesus, they will be saved. Well, Paul would clearly disagree, right? Paul says, no, you must believe. Paul is broken over the fact that they have not believed in Jesus. And then he lists eight privileges of the Jewish people there. It starts in verse 4. He says, they're Israelites. And to them belong the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law, the worship and the promises. So they're Israelites. They're the nation God chose and formed and preserved. And to them belong the adoption. I don't think this is the same kind of adoption that we saw in Romans 8, 14 to 16. This isn't new covenant adoption, but he's saying God became the father of the nation as he redeemed them. Exodus 4, so Exodus 4, very early on, Exodus 4, 22, God tells Moses to tell Pharaoh that Israel is my firstborn son. Jeremiah 31, verse 9 says, God is the father to Israel. To them belong the adoption. To them belong the glory. Well, what's the glory? I think the glory is God's presence with his people. The Shekinah glory, the manifestation of his presence in a unique way. God is present everywhere, but he was especially present with his people in the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, and in the temple later. Exodus 29 speaks of God meeting with his people at the tent of meeting. And that place would be sanctified by his glory, by his presence. They have the glory. Exodus 40 says the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. He was uniquely present among them. Later on, the temple is referred to as the house of the Lord. And 1 Kings says the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. To them belong the glory. To them belong the covenants. Just think of the covenants we find in Scripture. Noah and the promise that God would not wipe out his people again. God would continue to extend mercy. And then we have Abraham called out of paganism and promised that he would be preserved and that through his family all the world would be blessed. Then we have the old covenant with the nation of Israel that gave them the law and the sacrifices and the tabernacle. And then we have the covenant with David and the temple and the promise that there would be this son of David who would rule forever. Then the new covenant that God would come and change their hearts from the inside out and bring full and final forgiveness of sins. To them belong The promises to them belong the giving of the law. Remember, God didn't reveal himself to all the pagan nations. He revealed himself to one nation, Israel. We saw that back in chapter 3. Flip over there, Romans 3, verse 1. Speaking again of the Jewish people, what advantage has the Jew... Or what is the value of circumcision? It's much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. Again, other nations were not. To them belong the giving of the law. Listen to the way Deuteronomy describes it in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 5. See, I have taught you statutes and rules. He's talking about the law. As the Lord my God commanded me that you should do them in the land you are entering to take possession of it. Keep them and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples, the nations, who, when they hear all these statutes, will say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? And what great nation is there that has statutes and rules so righteous as all this law that I set before you today? So to them belong the giving of the law. God uniquely was present among them and God uniquely revealed himself to them. To them belong the worship, verse 4 says. The worship here is referring to the temple worship. It was this visible order of service. God could not be approached just any way that he wanted. Remember some of the stories in the Old Testament when that happened? It didn't go well. God will be approached the way he wants to be approached. And you can read about that all over the Old Covenant. Hebrews 9, 1 to 7 is a great place that kind of lays out. What is that worship? What is that visible order of service? 
They needed a blood sacrifice. They needed washing for purification. They needed a priest to enter on our behalf. This wasn't revealed to everyone. This one was revealed to Israel. To them belong the worship. To them belong the promises. Just think of just some of the promises of the Old Testament. Genesis, right at the beginning, Genesis 3.15. Fall comes, what is God going to do? Well, he promises that there would be an offspring of the woman who would crush the head of the offspring of the serpent. Even though he would be bruised, he would defeat him. Again, Genesis 12, the promises of worldwide transformation, a people that encompass all nations through Abraham's offspring. Genesis 12, Genesis 49, through the line of Judah, the scepter would not depart. And to Judah would be the obedience of not just Israel, but all the nations. Isaiah 53, the suffering servant, this servant who would come and he would rule, but he would also suffer on our behalf. Isaiah 7, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and we shall call his name Emmanuel. Isaiah 9, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The promises of Christmas. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The promises. Micah 5, 2, that a king, the Messiah, would come from Bethlehem. To them belong the promises. Look at verse 5. See two more privileges in Romans 9, 5. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. So to them belong the patriarchs, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the 12 leaders of the 12 tribes and Moses and Joshua and Samuel and David. To them belong the patriarchs. And then finally, last but certainly not least, the Messiah comes from their race. Jesus was Jewish. Jesus didn't have feather hair and Jesus wasn't white. He's born of a woman. He's born under the Jewish law. And both Matthew and Luke give us his genealogy all the way back. And Matthew says Jesus is the son of David, the son of Abraham. Jewish lineage through and through from their race according to the flesh. In terms of his human nature, he was Jewish. The Christ. And as I will remind you weekly... Christ is not a last name. Christ is a title. Jesus did not have Christ on his mailbox. Was not Joseph and Mary Christ. Christ means the anointed king, the Messiah, the son of David, the coming liberator. And look how Paul speaks of this Messiah. This Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Jesus Christ is God over all. And this is just historic Christianity. This is what the church has always affirmed, the deity of Jesus Christ. This is orthodox Christianity. Sometimes we Baptists have not appreciated some of the creeds and confessions of the church. I want to read a couple. Let me read from the Nicene Creed. 325, notice what it says about Jesus. This is what the church has always affirmed. We believe in one God... The Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, from the Father, before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made human. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again, according to the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead, his kingdom will never end. This is all the leaders of all the churches in the world at that time coming together for what's called an ecumenical council and agreed 
that this is who God is and this is who Jesus is. Very God of very God. Let me read a couple hundred years later. Church comes together again to combat false teaching. That's often what the councils were for. And they come up with this creed. We call it the Chalcedonian Creed from 451. Notice how the church has spoken of Jesus. We then, following the Holy Fathers, all with one consent, teach men to confess one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. The same perfect in Godhead and also perfect in manhood. Truly God and truly man, of a reasonable soul and body, consubstantial, that word means coessential, consubstantial with us according to the manhood, in all things like unto us without sin, begotten before all ages of the Father according to the Godhead. And in these latter days, for us and for our salvation, born of the Virgin Mary, the mother of God, according to the manhood, one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, to be acknowledged in two natures, divine and human, inconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, inseparably. The distinction of natures being by no means taken away by the union, but rather the property of each nature being preserved and concurring in one person and one subsistence, not parted or divided into two persons, but one and the same Son, and only begotten God the Word, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the prophets from the beginning have declared concerning him, and the Lord Jesus Christ himself taught us, and the creed of the Holy Fathers has handed down to us. Whew, it's a mouthful, but notice what he's saying. Jesus Christ is God. That's the essence of the same essence. And in the Son, we have two natures, human and divine, but of the same essence as what the church has always affirmed. And the reason is not because a bunch of people got together and said so. It's because they base these councils upon Scripture. Right here, the Messiah, who is God over all. Flip over to Romans 10, verse 9. Notice what he says about Jesus. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, this word Lord is the word that often translates the word Yahweh in the Old Testament. Jesus is God and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You'll be saved. Look down at verse 13. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. Again, the word for God, Adonai, and he's referring to Jesus. Maybe flip a page over to chapter 14, verse 9. Speaking of Jesus, for to this end Christ died and lived again that he might be Lord. He's not just Lord of the dead, he's Lord of the living. He's the Lord. How can you be Lord of the dead and living? Because you're not just a mere human, you are the God man. So many passages we could read Philippians 2 9 to 11. God the Father has highly exalted him, the Son, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. What is that name? It's God, Lord, Yahweh. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Titus 2.13 says that we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is our God. He is our Savior. Thomas replies to Jesus, my Lord and my God. Colossians 1 couldn't be more clear. Verse 16. For by him all things, this is speaking of the Son, by the Son all things were created. In heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Jesus. Through him and then for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's the head of the body of the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of deity was pleased to dwell. Or Colossians 2.9. In him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. This is basic Christian teaching. John 1.1. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. Hebrews 1.3, the sun is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. You get the picture. So if you don't know the Lord today, this Jesus Christ must be reckoned with. 
C.S. Lewis' famous trilemma. We can't say like someone he wants to do, well, Jesus, yeah, he was a good guy. He was a wise teacher. He was a, a, a helpful rabbi. That just won't work. As Lewis says, we've got to either call him a liar and his followers a liar. We've got to call him a lunatic and his followers a lunatic. Or we've got to call him Lord. Which is it? Because he said some crazy things if he weren't God. And his people said some crazy things about him if he weren't. They're liars or they're, they're, they're lunatics, crazy. Or he really is who he said he is. God. Friends, there is no more important question than how you will respond to the risen Lord Jesus Christ. If you have not trusted him, you can do that today. You can entrust your life to this God who will be for you. If you will turn from your sin and trust in him, he will forgive you of your sins. If you have questions about that, man, these elders up here, there's nothing more we'd rather talk about. Don't be like these Israelites who had all these privileges, all this revelation, all this grace, and still rejected the Lord. And here, in terms of Romans 9 to 11, Paul introduces a little bit of tension here. Wait a minute. What's going on with Israel? And that's what 9, 10, and 11 are going to resolve the tensions for us. We will jump in next week. But I want to close this morning with four takeaways about evangelism, about personal witness. Evangelism, that four-letter word that we all are called to and we all struggle with. So number one. How can we go about evangelism? What can we learn here from Paul? Well, not so much this passage. We're going back to Romans chapter 1. Number one, we need to trust the power of the gospel. It's not our persuasiveness. It's not our wit. It's not our ability to answer every question. God uses the message to save. Romans 1.16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the message is the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. God uses this message of Christ crucified in behalf of sinners to open hearts and to remove the blinders. It's what he promises to use. And so we must be clear on what it is first, right? What is the gospel? Well, one of the things we use in membership class is these four hooks. I think I first read it in J.I. Packer's book, Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God. Four hooks to help you. What is the gospel? Number one, God. Number two, sin. Number three, Christ. Number four, response. You have those hooks in your mind. You can share the gospel. God, who is God? Well, he's the loving creator. Created all things, therefore he has authority. He's loving, he's gracious, but he's also holy. And he will punish all sin. And that goes to the next point, sin. All of us, in the way we've lived, the way we've spoken, the way we have thought, we have sinned against God. That's a problem. If God is holy and we are sinful, there's a problem. And there's several passages we could memorize with each one of these hooks. What's the good news? Number three, Christ. Christ came. He lived the life we were called to live and didn't. He died the death we deserved to die and didn't because he took our place. Jesus Christ died in the place of sinners. And then fourth, what is our response? Repent and believe. Turn from our sin, believe the gospel. We need to be clear on that message. Really, if, one of those, if those four points aren't there, the gospel hasn't been shared. So we want to be clear on the gospel. Yes, we want to share our story, but we want to bring the gospel into our story because it's the gospel God promises to use. And so we want to be clear on it. We don't want to assume it. As we live in an increasingly post-Christian nation, we want to be clear about the gospel and trust that God will save through it. To use the language we've seen in Romans, we go about, and we'll see more in chapter 10, we issue that general call. Whosoever will may believe, you need to trust in the Lord. And through our general call, God saves in power through the effective call. Number two, so trust the gospel. Number two, we've got to speak the truth. We see that in, in verse one with the apostle Paul. He says, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. And so we can't soften the message. The message of the gospel is increasingly offensive. It just is because we think we're just fine, thank you. And so we can't be tempted to soften the hard edges of the message of the gospel. It's not ours to do. It's his message, right? Galatians 1.11, this gospel is not of human origin. It's not man's gospel. It comes from the Lord. Second Corinthians 5 calls us as believers ambassadors. You know what the job of an ambassador is? 
It's basically to take the message from one king to wherever he wants it. He doesn't write the message. He doesn't edit the message. You know, if you have a king who sends an ambassador, I want you to go to that city and I want you to tell them, I'm coming in judgment. Unless they pay the taxes, by the end of the month, I'm coming in judgment. Here's the the message and that ambassador reading it. Oh, man, this is not going to go well. They're not going to be happy with this. So he gets there. You know what? I came from King so-and-so and I've got this message here and he just wants you to know he loves you. He's got a wonderful plan for your life. If you get around to it, those taxes, that, that would help. All right, thanks. What would happen to that ambassador? Going to be fired, right? It's not the message. It's not the job of the ambassador to change the message. He doesn't have the prerogative to change it. He is to be faithful to the message, even the hard parts. The message comes from the king. We just take it wherever we're sent. And so we tell the gospel, the whole gospel, which means we have to talk about holiness. We have to talk about sin and we have to talk about judgment. And in Abilene, it adds a layer of challenge. Evangelism in Abilene requires a little bit of skill and a backbone of steel. Why? Because 99% of the people in Abilene say they are Christians, at least in my experience so far. Yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I go to church. But as Cody laid out for us a couple Sunday nights ago, there is this concept, this reality of an unsaved Christian meaning a false convert, meaning someone who says they're a believer, but they actually have not been born again. It's what James 2 would call demon faith. James says even the demons believe and shudder. So for someone just to say, yeah, yeah, I believe in Jesus, that doesn't mean they're an actual Christian. doesn't mean it's saving faith. Because true belief, true saving faith will lead to changed lives. We're not saved by changed lives. We're saved by faith. But if our faith is genuine, it will slowly, progressively change us over time. We will be turning from sin. We will be committed to a local church, loving the brothers and sisters. Cody unpacked, if you weren't here, some of the scariest verses in Scripture. And we in Abilene need to hear this. And we need to know this. Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone, Jesus says at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, on that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. And in a Bible Belt type city like ours, we have got to be burdened by the unsaved Christian, by the false convert. And so how? What does that mean? How can we speak the truth when it comes to our personal witness in a city like Abilene? Well, I think we can't settle for just hearing, yeah, I'm a Christian. Hey, tell me, do you know the Lord? Yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian. Do you go to church? Yeah, 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 I go to, I go to church. We can't settle there. We can't stop the conversation there. As hard as it is, we've got to speak the truth and we've got to have a follow-up question. And it's uncomfortable, isn't it? But if we truly love them, we can't just stop because we all know, listen, this was me. All through high school, you would ask me, Blake, are you a Christian? Yeah, 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 I believe Jesus and all that. Yeah, I go to church sometimes. What I needed was someone to get in my grill, my grill, my teeth, get in my face. Listen, man, here's what a Christian looks like. And so that's what we got to do. We got to press on past that first surface level question. How can we do it? Well, come up with some creative questions, some follow-up, secondary, get in your real questions. Here's a few. So you, you begin that conversation. You know, how, how's it going? How, how's your spiritual walk? Are you a believer? Oh, yeah, yeah. I told you last week that the last time I got to share the gospel, the guy said, oh, yeah, yeah, I don't go to church, but I believe all the same things. So I could have said, okay, great. All right. My duty's done. Instead, I had to get uncomfortable. Well, well, what do you mean? Like, tell me what you mean by believe all the same things. And that's when he said, well, you know, do good, be good, good will come to you. That's not the message of the Bible. I said, friend, we don't believe the same things, actually. We believe there are none good. And that's what the cross is all about. And so what's a follow-up question that we can ask? Here's a few. And you, you, you cater these to how you want. So they say, yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, I go to church. Okay, cool. When were you converted? Let them share their testimony. Or maybe, hey, that's, that's great. Tell me about your conversion experience. 
And maybe they don't know a day, and that's okay. I don't know a day, actually. I know a season. I know about a month-long period where I became a true Christian for my freshman year of college. But you press them. And if they say, oh, you know, I've, I've always been a Christian. No, you haven't. I was born a Christian. No one's born a Christian. Well, you know, my parents were Presbyterian. That doesn't mean a thing. And so you can ask the next question. If they don't have some spot in their life where they moved from living for their own glory or convicted of sin, turned from that sin and trusted in Jesus Christ, they probably are not converted. And so that question, tell me about your conversion. Tell me how you became a Christian. Another one, they say, yeah, yeah, no, I go to church. Hey, that's great. How has the current sermon series impacted you? I try to keep a tab on some of our bigger churches in town to know what they're preaching through. So I can ask this question. Yeah, tell me about that sermon series. Oh, you know, yeah, it's been, it's been good. Well, when's the last time you've been there? Oh, you know what? It was Easter. It was Easter, 2012. <laughs> some, some question we can push on them a little bit. So they say, yeah, no, I'm a Christian. Sweet. What are y'all studying? Yeah, I go to church. Superb. Are you in a small group at your church? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a Christian. Fantastic. What are you doing to grow spiritually? I go to church. That's phenomenal. On what basis do you think you're born again? That one might be a little bit too much in the grill. <laughs> but these are, these are uncomfortable questions, questions to be sure. But just think, if you do that and they're a believer, they'd probably be encouraged. Wow, you know what? This person whom I kind of know, maybe I don't know, they were bold enough to, to see how I really am doing spiritually. I'm thankful for that. I'm even emboldened. I love to get evangelized. I'm so encouraged when people try to come share the gospel. I just want to hug them. I'm like, God bless you in the work, man. So they'll, if they're a believer, they'll be encouraged. If they have the spirit, they'll be encouraged. If they're not, just think, your question, your pressing, the spirit can use that in huge ways to get them thinking, you know what? I don't know if I really have had a conversion experience. Well, on what basis do I think I'm a Christian? You know what? I haven't been in church in years. I'm not growing spiritually. I don't even know what that means. So maybe you get a conversation and you get to the gospel. Maybe you don't, but you're pressing that question that they don't have confidence in and the Holy Spirit can haunt them. Some of that, that's your testimony. So be bold. Speak the truth. Get in their grill. Number three. We've got to be broken for the lost. Look at verse 2. The Apostle Paul. I speak the truth that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Here's what we've got to ask. I mean, do we really believe this book? Do we really believe it? Even just where we've been in Romans, do we really believe it? Think about where we've been, Romans 1, 2, and 3, all about the desperate plight of mankind. Starting in Romans 1, 18, the wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Romans chapter 2, verse 5, they who are in rebellion against God are storing up wrath for themselves, for the day of wrath. Do we believe in judgment? Do we believe in the wrath of God? Do we believe in the urgency of trusting in Jesus Christ? Do we believe in the glory of the gospel? And this is Romans 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. The goodness that we've been here hopefully encouraged by should cause us to get out of our shells. This gospel should cause us to go. The gospel comes to us because God intends for it to go to someone else. 2 Corinthians 5.14, the love of Christ compels us. Have we really experienced the love of Christ? After a chapter like Romans chapter 8, we ought to be compelled to go. Get the message out. We ought to be broken for the lost. They are facing God's judgment if they do not turn from their sin and turn to Christ. So how will we respond? Even just to what we've seen in Romans together. There's really three ways. We can just ignore it. And the enemy knows enough distractions to keep us apathetic. Or we can distort it. There's many in this city that do that, soften the hard parts of the message. Deny judgment, deny the exclusivity of Jesus Christ. 
Or we can be like Paul and we can live in light of it. If we believe in an eternal hell, we will be compelled to open our mouths. If we believe in eternal life, we can't keep silence. Here's how one atheist put it. How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them? And so are you broken for the lost? If not, begin to pray. Lord, help me. I believe. Help my unbelief. Lord, would you break my heart for the lost? Let me just ask you, when is the last time you shared Jesus with somebody? Even easier, when is the last time you prayed that God would save somebody? Number three, we've got to be broken for the lost. Number four, we've got to be obedient. Jesus is king. Jesus is God over all. We owe him our allegiance, and he tells us to go and make disciples. He tells us to go and be witnesses. It's the great commission, often treated like the great suggestion or the great omission. John Stott says too many Christians in America are deaf and dumb, deaf to the great commission, and tongue-tied in our testimony. And man, Paul's such a great example. We need to be like him, passionately obedient, passionately burdened, passionately confident in the message of the gospel. Just think about his life, all that he endured. Listen to 2 Timothy 2. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. We ought to have a burdened heart that leads to busy lives, enduring whatever may come. And for us, it's pretty minimal, honestly. What we need, church, is a fresh renewal of the calling of every Christian to deny self and to live sold out for the mission of God. Book of Acts type stuff where you have ordinary believers living ordinary lives with gospel intentionality. Every believer seeing themselves sent. Every believer functioning as an ambassador of Christ. Sent to your workplace. Sent to your neighborhood. Sent to the gas station, sent to the grocery store, sent to the children in your home, sent to the park, sent to the laundromats, sent wherever you are. John chapter 20, verse 21, all of us are called to this type of gospel ministry. It's not just for the so-called professionals. You are called, you are commissioned. Your baptism was your commission. The qualification for this gospel ministry is regeneration and the indwelling of the Spirit. And guess what? If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have both of those met already. We're all, all of us, in full-time gospel ministry. Some of us are funded by the church. Some of us are funded by the school district. Some of us are funded by hospitals, various companies. But you all are saved from the wrath of God and saved for the mission of God. So how are we doing? How are we doing? We've talked a few times this year about this Who's Your One campaign and initiative that the Southern Baptist Convention is doing. It's just an easy way to start. All of us can think of one person, one name of a family member, a friend, a coworker who does not know the Lord. If you don't have one already, who's your one? Who's one person that you can begin to pray specifically for and you can tell people in your D group to be praying for in your home group and in your class, hey, pray for so-and-so. I want to have a conversation. Here's how it's gone so far. Pray that I'll have another conversation. Pray that God would save them. Who's your one? Probably right now all of you can come up with that one person. Here's how I want to close this out. Let's just take a minute and I want you to pray for your one. If you don't have one, pray that God would show you one. Get out and meet your one. And pray for gospel opportunities and pray that God would save them through the power of the gospel. Let's spend a little bit of time praying silently. And then we'll continue and close out our service by singing together in worship. Let's pray for your one now.